if you think that the absolute ethical imperative is equality, then uh, your idea of God and humanity, of the plan of salvation, what remains of it, will be uh, you know, decisively conditioned by that view. And I think what's happening at Faith Matters, at BYU, in the Latter-day Saint intellectual world, at least, and all those who are influenced by it, as in the intellectual world more generally, what's happening is that uh, under cover of some uh, common vocabulary, such as love or following Christ, we're going into incompatible directions. Welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I'm your host. Today we have Ralph Hancock, who we have invited back to the Quick Show. He was on our show a couple of weeks ago. We wanted to get some further reaction from somebody on the inside, if you will, at BYU, um, to Elder Holland's speech and to the new Office of Belonging. Now, I've already given a longer introduction to Ralph. Uh, suffice it to say, Ralph is a professor of political philosophy at Brigham Young University. He's been there for 34 years. He is undergrad at BYU and did his doctorate in political philosophy at Harvard. Ralph, very generally speaking, what is, in your mind, the general reaction of the faculty at BYU to Elder Holland's speech? Well, let me acknowledge first that it's a difficult question, and I don't want to uh, overstate my knowledge as an insider at BYU. Obviously, uh, any one of us faculty members is only touching a certain part or certain parts of the elephant that is BYU at uh, any given moment, uh, but I am there and I, I talk with people and, and I'm aware directly or through colleagues, through my students of, um, of the scuttlebutt, so to speak, of, uh, of the mood of things that are being said. Uh, so uh, with that uh, caveat, uh, let me venture that a significant, you might say a, a modal reaction representing some kind of a critical mass because I know there's no way to talk about what would come out in a majority survey or something like that. It's not the kind of impressions. It's not what I'm trying to get to with my impressions. But my, my impression from experiencing some interaction with colleagues and collecting a few reports from colleagues and students. Uh, I suppose I would be inclined to regard the, uh, the modal reaction, the reaction of a critical mass, the, the kind of the, the leading reaction, in the sense of the reaction of those who are most active and most likely to uh, assert their voices with respect to the direction of university of, of the university, uh, I would describe the reaction as uh, a kind of perplexed assent, and in many cases, a perplexed and grudging assent. That is to say, all right, he is Elder Holland. Uh, he's in charge and I'm not, so to speak, uh, sort of trying to voice the, the mood of mm -hmm. this modal faculty member uh, that I'm imagining. He's in charge and I'm not. Uh, that's the ascent, but the perplexity is, but what is exactly is he talking about? Why is he judging me in this way? Why is he putting the university on probation? For what possible cause? What can his concern possibly be. So there's that uh, perplexity mingled with a touch of alarm that, you know, those who are in charge 
might be dissatisfied in some fundamental way with the direction of things. Uh, the perplexity, uh, only God can search hearts, but it's hard to know what mix of uh, naivete, uh, allow me to say cluelessness, or on the other hand, bad faith, uh, not unwillingness to recognize and face the fairly conspicuous problems to which Elder, Colin, Elder Holland calls our attention. Uh, I, I have no idea how to judge the, the mix of uh, naivete and bad faith in this perplexity. But you're saying that there is, you, you're, you have a sense that there is a, a, a feeling of uh, aloofness almost to some degree. I mean, if it's, uh, you know, what, what, what is, why does he need to call attention to this? Because we're already on the right track? That Yeah, I mean, um, what possibly could we be doing wrong? Why does he not trust us? There's this sense of grievance. We deserve to be trusted, and he's not trusting us. And as I say, I can't sort out the elements of what I would regard as naivete on the one hand, or the only alternative <laughs> for me would be uh, some kind of bad faith, self-deception, uh, uh, mendacity. I'm not charging. I'm saying I don't know what to Okay. Make. So, so let's put this, let's frame this a little bit. You, you, you've got an article out on Public Square Magazine. It refers to a Faith Matters, which is a podcast uh, episode in which you have a couple of, uh, the, I, the, I think it's the Chavez's, they've got a, they're a couple they give the, uh, uh, they're the hosts of the podcast and they have as guests, Tom Christofferson and uh, uh, scholar Patrick Mason on there. And, and so I think you, you've got a response to Elder Holland's talk kind of through that filter of this episode to kind of look into the minds a little bit of, of, of what might be somewhat of a flavor of a BYU response being that Faith Matters is closely related to the Maxwell Institute and you have intellectuals that are involved with this in, in the interview. Um, I, I just want to give real quick, just kind of my, my thoughts on this. I did see the episode. I actually went through it twice. Um, I, I find it very interesting, Ralph, that as, as you, you, the, the response to Elder Holland's talk, there seems to be all of this skirting around of, of to me, what is the primary issue? Uh, on on the talk uh, of Elder Holland, which is simply the doctrine of the family, and and I see this over and over again, where there's a um, there's an unwillingness to go to the 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 anchor point of the talk, not of his talk, but but of the issue of the problem, which is the doctrine of the family. Basically, it's the proclamation to the family. And, and so I go, I went through that, that interview a couple of times, Tom Christofferson, who's a gay faithful member of the church actually brings it up three or four times that this is his issue. It's a problem with the doctrine of the family that he wants to change, but everybody else seems to typically move around this specific issue. Did you get the same feeling as you went through this episode? Greg, I think, uh, skirting around to use your term is the whole point of the Faith Matters episode and a point on which uh, with varying degrees, uh, with slightly different alignments uh, to which you have referred, it's really uh, the, the common objective, it seems to me, of all four participants in this Faith Matters conversation. Um, that's why I, I entitle my analysis at Public Square, Elusive Reasoning. You see, their, their title was Elusive Unity at BYU. So in fact, I'm saying, sure, if you refuse to grant, uh, to acknowledge, to grasp the 
proposed source of unity, the doctrine of the church as appealed to by Elder Holland, then of course, unity is going to be elusive. You, you could even say, another way of putting this point about skirting, you could say that the whole objective of faith matters in this interview, and my hypothesis is more generally, that the whole strategy is one of uh, substituting an elusive unity, a unity without determinate substance, a unity that is unsettled in its relation to positive church teachings to substitute this elusive unity for the unity that Elder Holland is appealing to. And, uh, and that unity that Elder Holland is appealing to is, is not redu reducible to, to doctrine, to theological propositions or to the family proclamation, but it has everything to do with them. I would say that Elder Holland's unity is unthinkable without at least a minimal doctrinal unity and the unity sought, uh, evoked, uh, conjured by faith matters is deliberately elusive. Okay, so uh, to that point, um, and, and I just want to say the caveat here, I, as I looked at it, I, I think that that uh, the individuals, all four of the individuals is in this this interview, to me, were very supportive of the church, um, not as supportive of some of the things maybe Elder Holland said in his talk, but I, I do want to just put out there that uh, um, I, I think the commonality here is that they were trying to be supportive of of uh, Elder Holland as as an apostle of the Lord and and of the church. Uh, so this is an attack directly for me on 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 any of them. It's it's about their words, and I, I try to distinguish that. But elusive unity, then it, it seems to me that there's unity is wonderful when everybody unites to your own ideas, right? I I, I can I can say when you talk about elusive unity, um, if you've got a camp that's kind of like okay, go Elder Holland, and, and then you've got a camp that says. That, that, that is a little bit perplexed by his words over here. They both want unity, right? But they're, 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 their anchor point is in a different spot. So the elusiveness of this is always going to be, well, what is, what is that anchor spot? And that's, that brings me right back to the, the, the whole point of skirting around the, uh, the, the doctrine of the family. I see it's very clear on one side, people say, He's talking about the doctrine of the family, and that's a big issue. It's got that's the anchor point. On the other side, I just wish there was more clarity that would say, you know, we want the doctrine to change because that's what, when you really strip everything away, that seems to be what is wanted. And, and it's like, okay, I, you get to want what you want, desire what you want, but yes, yes, great. Clarity well, would be nice. Thank, thank you. I'm glad you noticed that. I'm glad it was uh, as clear to you as it was to me that that's what everyone really wants. Uh, but then we have to acknowledge, we have to recognize that the elusiveness, the, the hiding the ball in a way concerning what is really wanted is part of the appeal, is central to this appeal to unity. How, after all, can you unify those who want the family proclamation to be sustained and supported, and those who want to overcome it, move beyond it, relegate it to some archaic past, how can you unify these without being elusive? And you, you bring this up in your article. You say this, I'm quoting from you. It says, it is evidence of the confusion wrought wrought by the complex reasoning of intellectuals considered expansive. Their distaste for the simple categories of either or, that they were somehow surprised and disappointed that the apostle should insist upon 
the difference between loving a person and agreeing with a person's opinion on a moral question for you, Ralph, then, then that, uh, again, those two camps and the two anchor points of unity there being elusive. Are you saying that because you're, you can skirt around this and be elusive, you don't have to determine an either, or is, is that what's what, what you see? Well, uh, again, I'm saying, and here we, we uh, this again should be prefaced with the acknowledgement that only God can search hearts. So I, I don't know what degree of uh, just how to, what, what the uh, mix of uh, sincerity and uh, rhetorical uh, ruse uh, might be among uh, the Faith Matters participants or others who agree with them. Uh, I, I can't make that judgment. Really, I'm, I'm talking about the, the structure and impact of the rhetoric, the way the argument works, because there is an argument that can be extracted from the back and forth of the conversation. And the argument posits these two sides. And I give Patrick Mason lots of credit for saying at one point that there are these sides and the tension is unsustainable between them, which would seem to lead to the conclusion that actually you need to choose a side. Actually, or is the unity if they're if it's unsustainable? Yeah. yeah, actually, in fact, you are on one side or the other. But after really approaching this um, bracing insight, rather than candidly taking a side, Mason and everyone in the interview seems to go along with him on this, uh, posits a kind of third way, and I think we know from. <laughs> from ideological history that third ways are usually uh, illusory. I think this one is. The third way is, well, uh, President Holland and the authoritative church has his teaching. We recognize his authority, but like there are these lived experiences that are real of LGBTQ Members, and that's a an irrefragable, an unquestionable reality from this standpoint. So you have these uh, an irresistible power and an immovable force here. You have the reality of the church authority and the reality of the, I would say, of the alleged authority of these um, unquestionable experiences or these unquestionable uh, identities. The third way proposed is, um, well, I, I think I can, I, I break down the strategy and how, how deliberate, how canny it is. Uh, I don't attempt to judge, but the, in effect, the strategy consists in two elements. Love defined as in a nutshell, I would say relativistic compassion, love that uh, accepts as a premise the ultimate authority of your lived experience. And, you know, I'll put it in quotation marks because I don't believe in the <laughs> absoluteness of the category. So on the one hand, there's the uh, appeal to love, uh, love, whose only content is this uh, overriding respect for the lived experience of the individual, especially individuals uh, preoccupied with uh, sexual or other ideological identities. But the second critical uh, second critical arm of this rhetorical strategy is a certain idea of progress, or in the Latter-day Saint case, a certain idea of uh, continuing revelation. And these uh, strategies combine 
in a very heady uh, rhetorical mix. Uh, we can reduce the gospel to this relativ relativistic love for now, and that helps us wait for the Lord to raise up leaders who understand better than the present the ultimate reality and moral authority of personal experience. So the either or that both you and I, I think uh, that both of us think needs to be faced is in a way uh, the ball is hidden in this uh, back and forth between relativistic love and progress. Progress towards relativistic love and relativistic love that learns patience through a belief in progress as continuing revelation. Right. Patience in moving the unity to a different point. <laughs> right. I don't know where you're at. Okay. So to that point, a couple of things. One of the guests uh, as, as in discussing the idea actually directly of the doctrine of the family kept saying uh, something to the effect of it's, it's we, we, we should limit the gospel to being followers of Christ, right? That's, that's the most important thing. So that's a gen generic statement that has a lot of truth in it, right? To, to, to limit that to following Christ. And then one of the hosts brought this up and, and, and said that uh, their concern was that Elder Holland's speech felt like a warning to stop open discussion in the name of unity. So if I'm looking at that statement from the host, it's, it, 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 again, it's, 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 it's bilateral. You, you have a, a warning to stop open discussion as interpreted by the host, which basically means pulling away from one anchor point so that there would be open discussion to move it to another anchor point. And, and then that they, uh, um, that they wanted unity. It seems so obvious to me. I don't know that, that you 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 pull apart, you deconstruct the current anchor point a little bit, and then you open that up. You agitate a little bit, and and then you end up trying to unite at a another anchor point. And then uh, one of the one of the guests, as I said, is is limiting this to following Christ as as kind of the 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 highest value, which is true. But to me, as I pull those together, which were very close in the interview, those, those two points, it seems to me like you're kind of um, um, running through this Hegelian dialectic of, of compromise and, and trying to compromise to something where, again, it's just, I don't know, it's just so blatantly obvious to me that, that the, there's a change that's wanted. There's well, a change that wants wanted. And if I can say the solution to unity is to move to a different anchor point and then not have to go through the obvious changes and actually address what that change is in the doctrine, I can just say, we need to be followers of Christ. Did that yeah, ring true the, to you that, at all? That's the hiding the ball that I'm talking about here. And again, I don't, I make no attempt to gauge the degree of personal sincerity or not, but you see, you've just, Restated the two um, the two two arms of this rhetorical strategy, uh, following Christ or love a kind of uh, love without content or substance, it's love without any determinate idea of a plan of salvation that would fulfill the object of our love. Love without, um, do I say somewhere, any uh, determinate theological anthropology, without a religious idea, uh, a scripturally grounded idea of human nature, of the, of the kinds of beings and uh, the destiny of beings whom we're supposed to be loving. So 
So you have the, the argument from Christ-like love, which is meant to sort of bracket or put in suspense all uh, substantive doctrines about God, man, and our destiny. But then on the other hand, you have the expectation that really contradicts the premise of the neutrality of this um, view of following Christ. You have the premise that uh, continuing revelation or progress will lead us to what in effect is an alternative substantive doctrine, an alternative view of the nature and purpose of humanity. So it is, it's rhetorically a, uh, a very effective strategy. It certainly seems to uh, work for many expansive Latter-day Saint minds, to use the faith matters term, but um, it is a way of suppressing the either or question that uh, to you and to me seems unavoidable. So I, uh, why, why this episode? I mean, I've seen several things out there on, on, on response to Elder Holland's speech. Um, uh, these seem like four very nice people. They, they, uh, they seem to me supportive of the church. Um, what, what is it that rang in your ears? What, what, what buzzed your ears here with this episode, uh, with faith matters that said, this is, this is kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to run reaction to elder Holland's speech through, through this, this episode, this, this podcast. Well, that's a good, that's a fair question. And it's uh, obviously, uh, a judgment call uh, for which I take responsibility to propose this as, uh, this podcast as uh, emblematic and as a kind of privileged way of uh, getting clear on some issues. Uh, Faith Matters is not part of BYU, but it's quasi-officially quasi connected to the Maxwell Institute. Uh, three uh, of the, uh, the board, Board of Advisors and Contributors, I think it is, of uh, Faith Matters are prominent fellows, leading minds, it would be fair to say, at BYU's Maxwell Institute, which is not at all to say that they all necessarily agree with everything or with the thrust of this podcast, but the question raises itself. And the, the very reason that you cited, which might be understood as reasons to uh, excuse, to cut some slack to, to uh, be at least gentle with the Faith Matters position in this podcast. The reason that I think clarity and rigor, not with regard to persons, but with regard to arguments is necessary is precisely because this seems to you and to many others to represent a sincere, faithful, church-supporting position. Uh, I'd almost say that, well, I will say, I, I would prefer a frank uh, espousal of the view that the church's teaching on the family and sexuality is immoral and must change to this shell game of love and progress that uh, submerges the critical issue. And I think the decisive effective intention that su submerges the decisive intention in this uh, rhetoric of love and continuing revelation. In a word, the faith matters, 
and I take that as representative of a broad swath of expansive Latter-day Saint opinion, including at BYU. The faith matters idea of love is not uh, <laughs> impartial, nonpartisan, above the fray. It implies taking one side of the issue. The likewise, the faith matters emblematic position on continuing revelation clearly involves taking a side on where it is judged that the that revelation should go, where the arc of revelation tends, if I might put it this way. I mean, it's it's so conspicuous, and this is true of uh, so many um, exploitations of the idea of continuing revelation. It is conspicuous that our interlocutors are not uh, neutral or in complete ignorance concerning what a good direction of revelation would be. I mean, if you want to talk about continuing revelation, you can imagine, let's say, not that I would propose it or favor it, but you can imagine going the other direction. You can imagine being more uh, categorical than Elder Holland. You can imagine uh, doubling down on the family proclamation in terms of doctrine, in terms of what shall I say, doctrinal enforcement. You can imagine all things, all kinds of things coming from continuing revelation. But clearly, uh, and again, I'm not proposing that we imagine that kind of direction for continuing revelation. But clearly, our uh, interlocutors at Faith Matters imagine a what is pretty legitimate to call a progressive direction to continuing revelation, progressing always in a distinctly modern direction of further authorizing the self-assertion of the self. Let me put it that way. So let me play the devil's advocate here just a little bit and, and say, well, because I think that, that, that a response to that might be something along the lines of what you said about lived experience. You know, we're, we're moving not just in, a, we're moving to me very quickly away from a modern world. We're moving into a postmodern world. And, and a very, a very strong tenet of postmodernism is this my own truth, my own lived experience is something that trumps all other objective truth. And, and this is what matters the most. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lack of a, a, a assimilation to objective truth. Um, what, what is the reconciliation then? I mean, because in, in listening to their, their episode, they're, they're very compassionate, right, about those that are part of the LGBTQ community that were offended by this. And again, I think the direct issue is not valedictorians and muskets. I think the issue is the doctrine of the family. And as evident by uh, um, the guests, on, on well, all four of them in, in this episode. But what, what is the reconciliation then? Is there no reconciliation? Because you, we've talked about the either or on this, that there's there, there is, you know, likely more a black and white issue on this. Um, is there no compromise? Is there no uh, bridge bridging? Again, if I'm on one side, I want to bridge so that you come over to my side. If if I'm on the other side, I want to create the bridge so you come to my side. So much of what I heard in this episode was kind of this idea of building bridges and and unity, right? And what, what, what do you say about those that are of the LGBTQ community and um, were offended by what they heard? Well, building bridges. The bridges, there are no bridges without some con content in terms of a strategy for the bases of unity. I have to, you, you raise a lot of questions by talking about modern and postmodern. I would... Um, I would um, sort of uh, address that very briefly by saying postmodernism does not succeed in getting beyond modernity because the thrust of modernity is a kind of um, emancipation of the self from 
any authoritative higher law, divine or natural. Okay, so I don't think uh, Michel Foucault or Jacques Derrida uh, really uh, escapes the orbit of that ethical sensibility that goes to the heart of modernity going back hundreds of years. So that's a big historical, philosophical question. But now in terms of bridges, uh, certainly in response to the faith matters, um, illusory bridge building, I would say, uh, I don't care for your bridge. I see that it's a, a one-way street or the bridge does a U-turn and comes back to the premises that are yours and not Elder Holland's. So I think, look, at a fundamental level, I'm saying there is an either or, and it's this either or between a substantive understanding of human beings as children, as sons and daughters of God, as the plan of salvation in an eternally sexed, which a term I like better than gendered, an, etern an eternally sexed uh, uh, cosmos in which the man-woman thing is a principle of reality. Uh, there is, there is an either or question between that understanding or really any uh, positive substantial understanding of the doctrine of Christ and an understanding of, human, of humanity within and under the doctrine of Christ. There is an essential either or between that and the still a thoroughly modern commitment to asserted individual self identities uh, that is the touchstone really. It's never developed, it's never explained or defended, but it's clearly the, the touchstone or the center of gravity of the faith matters position. I mean, listen to how they put it. There's, Elder Holland had these things to say and he's an authority, but you know, you have these lived experiences. So uh, yeah, I, I have no wish to add further hurt to those who are hurt by Elder Holland's confrontations with what they take to be as their lived experience. But what I'm saying is I do not give absolute authority to an individual's interpretation of his or hers or, or their lived experience. This idea of the absoluteness of the individual's self-experience is a mirage that is propagated by and driven by uh, all the energy of modern society, philosophically, economically, and in every way. Now, that doesn't mean that in every respect I'm against building bridges or accommodating or uh, seen an element of truth in a view that seems to be opposed. But we have to start by recognizing the clarity of this either or. Either the self is, a, is an eternal spirit or soul, to use the old fashioned language, whose meaning only comes to light in an effort to live up to norms, standards, to a law that precedes and is higher than this individual self, or the self is the ground of its own authority. There's an either or for you. Once we settle that, and you know which side of that uh, I would settle on, excuse me, but I'm pretty sure it's the same side as Elder Holland. Once you settle that, then we can talk about, well, what to do about people who are really uh, struggling well, Elder Holland talks about, he uses the word struggle, doesn't he? But see, even that word is rejected by uh, Tom Christofferson and others in the group. As soon as you say struggle, then you're saying, wait a minute, you mean my own assertion, my own identity is not something final, but something that uh, proposes to me a struggle uh, in relation to some higher norm? 
So there are many, we could talk about many avenues of building bridges, uh, many ways of uh, respecting and accommodating diverse opinions and experiences. But I propose you can't get off the ground until you recognize that there is an either or at the bottom of this whole discussion. Yeah, I did. I did think that was interesting that that there was that rejection of the idea of. I think the term actually they used was challenge. They were they were challenged in. Oh yeah. Um, but it's, you know, single mothers are challenged. <laughs> you know, I, a lot of us are challenged with a lot of different things, and and yes, that's a big one uh, as far as uh, you know sexual or, orientation or 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 a a, a same sex attraction. But uh, it is a challenge, especially in the church. It's a challenge because we have the doctrine of the family. So that, that I don't quite understand other than saying, let's unite around the idea of this other identity. Um, but uh, you, you brought up uh, the idea of the self and, and, uh, and a lived experience there again. And, and I think I, I can't help but think about Lehi's dream. And, and saying, okay, there's a way which is with the rod of iron that goes to the tree of life. And then there's a way of the self, which is pride, right? Which is, you, you can certainly, in my mind, look at a great and spacious building that is full of lived experience. And, and you know, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's not that it's not pertinent. It is, uh, it is but there's a way. And, and that way is what we would try to assimilate to. And, and become united in that way, not, how could we ever, I mean, as far as an elusive uh, a unity that they, that they talk about, how can you ever have a unity if everyone's drawn from their own lived experience? Every, everyone, if all you have is self, then, then there is no unity. So that's, that's a little bit confusing to me. Oh, as, but, uh, yeah, it is. It is confu confusing. At the same time, it's the uh, the strength of this rhetorical strategy, and it uh, and this uh, rhetorical strategy is rooted, as you know, in critical theory and in the um, countercultural effusion of the '60s, under whose shadow I think we're we're still living. But this strategy consists in um, what appears to be a complete uh, openness to diversity, which at the same time is proposing uh, quite a uh, definite and radical particular understanding of who we are as, as human beings. Um, so, Right, the idea is elusive, but the kernel of, let me call it individualistic humanitarianism, individualistic global humanitarianism is ever present. All um, what political philosophers call mediating ideas and institutions, church, family, community, nation, state. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by mediating? It's at the end of my sentence. Okay. All the institutions and their ideas that mediate between the individual and our abstract global humanity are uh, dissolved, or the, the work of this viewpoint is to uh, dissolve them, to progressively delegitimize any particular substantive idea of our humanity that is embedded in our membership in, uh, in church or nation, for example, in favor of what? In favor of a global humanity, a wide open, limitless humanity. But what is the content of this humanity? Well, in a way it has no content, but in, a, in another sense, the, the uh, inevitable default content is precisely this idea of the absolute authority of the self and its experience. So I propose to you that faith matters 
and all who resonate with them, at least taking as evidence the viewpoint expressed in this Faith Matters podcast. Faith Matters and those at BYU and elsewhere at the Maxwell Institute and elsewhere who resonate with them are operating within this this ontology, (laughs) this view of ultimate reality that consists in the fusion of extreme individualism with extreme collectivism or global humanitarianism without really confronting the difficulties, the incoherence, the unreality of that mindset, of that framework. Yeah, and that's I, I see that a lot too. I mean, honestly, if, I, if I'm looking at, uh, you know, for example, the social justice movement overall, it's, it's not addressed because there aren't a lot of solutions and replacements that come, seem yeah. to come from it. There's no substance oftentimes in, in there's a deconstruction, there's a critique, uh, there's a dialectic, but there's, it's, it, as you pull this down, it's like what, what comes in in place of it. And, and if I'm not talking about those points and that substance for why this way is better then obviously I'm, I'm, I'm skirting around the issues, right? I, I'm going to skirt around it because I don't actually have the answer. I'm and, offering, and, and, and I'm going back to this faith, this faith Matters episode, again, the answer here for them, or and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but at least for one of them for sure, was very simply change the doctrine. It, it's, it's, it's that simple. That's the answer that they're looking for. And um, I, 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 it just seems to me like you can break things down. That's fine. I mean, that's part of what academia is about, right? It's, 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 let's pull us apart. Let's be critical think, thinkers on this. Let's look at this and, and, and uh, uh, dissect it and, and understand it better, all of its complexities and nuances. But if you're, you can't just continue to break it down. You can't take principles, especially eternal principles, and just say, I'm going to keep deconstructing this and, and, then, and then say, well, it's just bad. It, it's a bad principle, and and therefore we're going to deconstruct it. What is the response? What is the answer? What is the substance that's going to be put in place of that? This is this is the utter lack of self criticism of so called critical thinking. This this uh, familiar now kind of style of critical thinking that always tends to the left, progressive, and ultimately global humanist viewpoint. The the one thing, everything, all actual content and substance that our communities and and institutions might actually provide is open to the the most strenuous criticism. But one thing that cannot be criticized, that is never really brought clearly into view, that is elusive precisely, is this this, uh, matrix of uh, extreme individualism and uh, vague global humanitarianism. And it, it, you, you raise the question, Greg, in terms of what a real alternative or what a solution is. That, that's a, a legitimate way of getting at the problem. But the question really goes to the very coherence of the thinking. Do they even know what they mean? This this matrix, extreme individualism, extreme collectivism has no meaning, but what is negative, or as you say, deconstructive. And you can see that in in the stance toward the family, not only in the Faith Matters podcast, but in, uh, allow me, progressivism more generally. That is, look, we can look at the proclamation on the family, and it's, you can easily argue that, well, the, the family is not a stable concept or institution. Over history, it's taken different forms in different times and places. And the proclamation on the family um, could therefore be seen to uh, be dependent upon a certain uh, late 20th century uh, Western or American, a bourgeois view of the nuclear family with a certain uh, 
role differentiation and certain uh, you know social and economic assumptions built in, et cetera, et cetera. You can always make that argument. There is no, there, there is no, there's never going to be a, uh, an account of a family that is um, devoid of some particular, I would say mediating historical and institutional references. We, we're talking about the goods of family such as we know that now. I'm utterly convinced that these goods have a universal element and are rooted in something universal in human nature. But the, uh, the, uh, the tendency, the strong tendency of progressive critical reasoning is to uh, break down our confidence that the family as we know it is eternal. Of course, there's an element in truth though, because the family as we know it is a certain version that historically played out at a certain time and place. But using this insight that there are other versions of the family, the upshot is therefore, forget about it. There's no, there's no stability possible. There's no substantial core. There's no eternal reality. And I think that's a logical leap that is not justified. Here's a bridge I'm building. You see, we can, we can acknowledge a certain relativism, historicism in any given understanding of the family. There is a, my olive branch to progressive historical relativism, if you like. But this does not mean that we have to concede to their standpoint, which really ultimately depends upon this incoherent absolute individualism, absolute global collectivism, if you will. We can grant uh, the limited relativism in our understanding of the family without uh, sacrificing our confidence that when we talk about family, we're talking about something eternal and that deserves to be protected by teachings and laws and covenants that are not uh, subject to this vaguely grounded criticism. Yeah, and I'd say also not just eternal, but ideal. And I, I, I'll say that. It, uh, it's, you don't always have the ideal. A lot of people don't. Hardly anybody does. But when you start stripping down the ideals of eternal principles, uh, I, that's, that, again, without proper replacement, if there could ever be such a thing, it, it's, that's a difficult thing. You know, it's, it's for us to uphold the ideals, even when we are not a part of the ideal. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, in, in, under a divorce with divorced parents very early in my life, but you know what we did, we pulled everything together amazingly with amazing parents. And, and we, we created the best possible, uh, um, look alike to an ideal situation because you, you, you aim to the ideal. You, you continue to aim to the ideal. I want to bring up, uh, your, your mediating, uh, on this and, and your, your mediation, you, you had, uh, responded. We're going to shift gears here just a little bit and, and go over to the office of belonging. You had responded to uh, an episode I'd done on the office of belonging. And, and you and I have had a little bit of the dis this discussion before about the, the, the opposites on a spectrum of, of equal opportunity to um, a, more of a forced equity on the other end. And, and, and in many cases, these offices usually called something along the lines of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was a little more similar to what the, the Office of uh, Race, Equity, and Belonging was trying to get in their, in their paper, in their research. It didn't quite come out that way, but uh, there's, there's that mediation also that I, I think also plays along with, with this idea of Elder Holland's speech. But looking at it in the filter of, of the Office of Belonging, the new Office of Belonging at, at BYU, which seems to, at least originally, its intent was to move more toward that end of the spectrum of equity, uh, of, of equal results. Um, you had this to say, you said, this, let me call this problem theological anthropology. 
What view of human nature informs our charity? I'm afraid all our voc vocabulary of love, charity, belonging, all of it is easily, quasi-necessarily subverted by an anthropology, a human understanding of humanity that owes more to Rousseau than to the gospel. Can you expound on that a little? Well, uh, I'm using some $10 academic words there, no doubt, but uh, anthropology is simply an understanding of human nature, not referring to the modern, uh, allegedly scientific uh, discipline of anthropology. Uh, theological anthropology is simply uh, a, an idea of human nature within a perspective, within a, uh, of a religious teaching, a religious uh, doctrine. The, um, many of the promoters, the instigators of uh, offices of belonging, what is the tripartite name again? Uh, belonging and what else? Uh, you, you have the vocabulary of love, charity, and belonging. Oh, I mean, the office at BYU now. Oh, yeah, it, it originally so. was... Uh, uh, originally was race, equity, and belonging. Mm -hmm. And now it has a new name. Uh, but let me pause here because I don't want to neglect to mention that uh, if you, if you, Greg, or others listening, haven't uh, heard uh, President Worthen's uh, devotional address from uh, a few weeks ago, was it now? Uh, this was really his topic about this office of belonging, et cetera. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very good talk, one that makes clear that uh, at BYU, an office of belonging must be based upon uh, principles of Jesus Christ uh, and the restored gospel. So uh, I... I recommend that. I think it was, a, to me, a very welcome statement by President Worthen. The question, how will that actually affect the, uh, the operation and notably the staffing of an office of belonging is a different kind of question. In my more um, grouchy satirical modes, uh, I have referred to a ministry of belonging to suggest the difficulty of uh, giving a like a bureaucratic uh, form to the Christian call to love one another and to embrace others within our community. I'm very suspicious of having bureaucratic experts in charge of judging what counts as belonging and how it should be incentivized, et cetera. Uh, nevertheless, President Worthen's uh, talk was a notable one, and I think shows that he shares uh, some, at least, uh, of these concerns. Uh, but now, remind me of precisely the question about belonging. Oh, so I was looking at the the. Uh, I, I just was asking you to expound a little bit more on on what you had said there. You know, we've talked about the spectrum of of, of equal opportunity and and equity, yeah. and how do you mediate between those two. Um, most of these offices on campuses of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, are very much pushed toward a, an equity outcome, right? That's what matters is what is the outcome? It's a lot of what people th actually think critical race theory is, that it's the matter of looking at the data, breaking things out into intersectional groups and saying, well, where is there a disparity? And we're going to make sure that though that disparity is, is equaled out. And, and there was a lot of that type of language in the report from, from the Committee nope. on Race, Equity, and Belonging that uh, is the precursor, basically, to the Office of Belonging. Um, how do you see it playing out? I, you brought up staffing, and that, to me, is the biggest issue. What are you looking for? When you say belonging, usually when someone talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're not talking about even diversity of ethnicity or sexual orientation. What they're talking about is you're trained in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. And that's, that's who's brought in because 
And, and that's a very specific political agenda. We had talked about this before. You talked about, well, because I had asked you, is this going to be political? And you said, well, is it going to have power? Because if it has power, then it's going to be political. How, how do you see it playing out? In a word, I don't, I don't think uh, my friends and I will be like waiting by our phones, uh, expecting that perhaps we might be called to uh, participate in the governance, the administration of the, uh, of the regime of belonging. And that this presents a dilemma to the university because indeed those who are, if we rely upon experts in some um, academic or human resource field, these are experts that are not ideologically innocent. They, they, they come with a certain worldview. So let me just say, I think the fundamental question uh, is that of radical egalitarianism, a radical, um, a radical elevation of the passion for equality, to paraphrase Tocqueville, an elevation of the passion for equality as the first principle, even the sole principle of justice, and of ethics and religious morality. And so we're really back to the framework of the either or that um, I extracted from my analysis of the Faith Matters interview. Is the heart of our religion, the maximal achievement of equality, which cashes out practically into, as you say, uh, the policy of equity. Is that true religion? Is that the essence of true religion? Huh? Visiting the widow and the homeless, attending to those who are suffering, but beyond that, in this view, changing the world to reduce ever more to a minimum any statistical disparities between whatever groups are judged by the official ideology to be statistically relevant. Blacks, women, sexual minorities, etc. I mean, as you suggested earlier, there are all kinds of, all of us suffer from one or more disadvantages. I, I'm not at all inclined to complain about my fate in life or the family I was born into, the uh, moral and religious and uh, intellectual education to which I had access. So. I'm not at all inclined to complain, but any one of us could look at his own or her own personal experience from the standpoint of grievance, which is the standpoint of envy. Any one of us could say, actually, other people are doing better than me because they had advantages that I don't have. That, that argument from envy and resentment, resentment is boundless, infinite, unending. And the whole rhetoric of equity and the religious sensibility obsessed with equality that goes along with it uh, invites, encourages, solicits this uh, standpoint of victimization. It rewards the victim mentality and the victim stance which is a political stance in the primary sense that it is a strategy for getting more, more resources and more respect. So if we imagine that somehow the, the, the uh, simple facts of the human condition as a political condition, if I may say as a political philosopher, the simple fact that people will uh, embrace ideas and exploit them to their own uh, 
advantage and see the world through the lenses of ideas that uh, suit uh, their own situation and their own cause, what can we expect from an equity or let me just say pure equality centered objective other than the stimulation of ever more envy, ever more demands, ever less personal responsibility. Yeah, it's, I agree with that. I think that, that ultimately that's what grievance devolves into. Uh, I think that's very difficult to avoid. Um, you had said that in terms of, you know, you hear a lot about the mission of BYU, how it needs to be a unique place. Um, you said, you've said it's not easy to be unique. So many now interpret our Christianity as a deity backed spiritualized version of social justice. What do you mean by that? I mean, what I've been saying all along and thank you for bringing that up because let me make this point as clearly as possible. We have a problem here because we're dealing with two religions that overlap on, you know, maybe 80 to 90% of the vocabulary. So we think we're saying the same thing, but our two religions are informed by two distinct uh, ontologies, cosmologies, theological anthropologies, to throw in all my academic $10 words at once, a, a different vision of what deity and humanity are. Um, and on one vision, there is no higher ethical plane, ethical horizon than the pursuit of effective equality, judged finally by equality of outcomes, equity, in other words. And this, this is a political and ideological view that cannot help but decisively sway or put its stamp on one understand, one's understanding of religious truth. If you think that the absolute ethical imperative is equality, then uh, your idea of God and humanity, of the plan of salvation, what remains of it, will be uh, you know, decisively conditioned by that view. And I think what's happening at Faith Matters, at BYU, in the Latter-day Saint intellectual world, at least, and all those who are influenced by it, as in the intellectual world more generally, what's happening is that uh, under cover of some uh, common vocabulary, such as love or following Christ, we're going into incompatible directions. So I'm willing to seem to be a, uh, a grouchy and overly rigorous or judgmental uh, philosopher. I'm willing to seem to be one in order to call attention to this divide because it's better to recognize it early than late. And that's why I have a little, a little less patience than you seem to, Greg, with the uh, sincerity, the goodwill, the professions of support for the church that come from faith matters and others like them. Again, I don't deny these are good people that they can, they have and can accomplish some good, but I think it's a great disservice to the young and anyone else finding their way in life ethically and religiously to mute the differences or cover over the, over the differences between two essentially different religions. And I would agree with the two religion uh, uh, metaphor there. I think that's exactly what it is. Um, and, and to be clear, I, you know, my, my issue is more, I, I just, I, I just have a rule. I try to separate people from words. And so as far as the words go, absolutely. And I think it needs to be brought out. I, I think that your, 
the title of your article is very good in, in terms of uh, elusive reasoning as compared to elusive unity, because it is so elusive. Why is it elusive? That's what people, I think, really need to ask themselves. Why is this elusive? It shouldn't be. It should be clear. And we should be able to say, okay, here's, here's what I see on this side. Here's what I see on this side. It's very clear to me. And what is my choice going to be? And then use your own agency. And instead of it just being kind of muddied waters, uh, that's what frustrates me the most. The elusive, what I'm saying is, and I'm talking about words, not about persons, without being able to discern the intentions or the state of soul of sure. uh, the interlocutors. What I'm saying is, indeed, uh, very simply, the elusiveness is not accidental. It has a structure. It, it has a content though it denies having one, it goes in a certain direction. It really is uh, a, um, it is at least an entering wedge of an alternative religion. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree that it, it is intentional. I, I, I do believe that that is true. Um, Ralph, anything else you wanted to cover? Go through what, what, what do you see? You have, you have the, uh, I want, I did want to bring up, uh, elder Holland's talking about, um, this, uh, the direction of BYU in the future. I mean, if necessary, they're going to give up accreditation. He says they'll, he, the, he's obviously aware. The brethren are obviously aware of this collision that seems to be coming. Uh, again, we talked about this before, but, but you have a, 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 a religion in academia that is not uh, congruent to the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in, in most of its major tenets. Well, I, how, how do you bring, people might say, uh, uh, Jerusalem and Athens. I, I, I usually go back to Jerusalem and, and uh, Alexandria. How, how are you going to bring those together and, and can they live together? Can, can, can you have a, a marriage there when, when both sides are, 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 when there's too much of an either or in place? If only it were a tension, a tension between Jerusalem and Athens and all their glory and all the, uh, the uh, discernment and, um, and uh, delicacy, nuance of classical philosophy. It's not Athens. It's... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, Florence to cite Machiavelli or uh, London or wherever Thomas Hobbes was from in England. It's, uh, it's New York. It's Hollywood. It's Jerusalem and Hollywood. Uh, that is the problem. And I may have uh, gone off on this topic in our earlier interview, but, uh, you know, by my uh, amateur prophetic ability, which may be completely uninspired, you use the word collision. I, I, I see great difficulty in avoiding some kind of train wreck. Uh, what Just what that will look like, there, there will be no smooth transition to a more, uh, dare I say, doctrinally conservative BYU. There are too many vested interests. I mean, we, we have a general ed education program in the offing just waiting for implementation that is... Uh, profoundly informed by a, a racial justice, critical race theory, yes, racial equity hmm. perspective. But just one example of the vested interests and vested mindset. And um, even if the, the, ma the critical mass of faculty at BYU heard this talk by Elder Holland and other talks like it, and... Uh, Say repented, <laughs> which is kind of what he's asking for. Say repented, looked at things differently, humbled themselves and acknowledged that uh, uh, their practices were not fully in alignment with a true understanding of the universe, university's mission. Even if that happened, what would they do to move forward? What would the mass of faculty, we've hired a faculty who hired on certain terms, on certain criteria with certain understandings and representing a certain uh, social mass, a certain corporate 
entity affiliated with the academy and the disciplines in general. We've, we've hired them on one set of assumptions, which we didn't examine carefully enough uh, in relation to the gospel, in my view, or to sound philosophy for that matter, to real Athens. We've hired them and they're here. And even with the best will in the world, how are they going to be other kinds of teachers, other kinds of professionals than what they've been for years or decades? Uh, and of course, there will be a certain number who would not uh, repent in any degree, in any way, and uh, who will be very eager to uh, express their grievances to the local news or to the Salt Lake Tribune uh, with a direct avenue to the New York Times and who knows, uh, Atlantic Magazine, what have you. Those are you know, vague features of the train wreck uh, that I see. So it doesn't mean the university will be uh, destroyed, although I think the, the future of the university is gravely at stake. I will say that. It doesn't mean that the university will fail. It will mean there will not be a rosy, continuous, consensual path to uh, a BYU more in line with what Elder Holland just said. Yeah, I... I share your concern there. I think it's, uh, as, as, as somewhat of an outsider, I, I just find BYU to be in a very precarious situation. <laughs> and uh, uh, in, intrinsic uh, agendas already in place. Uh, it, it, you know, you can put it down to a microcosm of something starting out brand new, like the Office of Belonging. Who are you staffing in there? What yeah. is the agenda? Um, you, you bring that out to a massive university like BYU, and, and uh, these things are already in place. So... Um, very difficult. Well, Ralph, thanks so much for your time again. Really enjoyed the discussion. We'll, we'll certainly be asking you to come back here. And of course, here on Quick Show, we're going to be following up and, and uh, updating uh, uh, the situations there at BYU and the Office of Belonging and hope for the best. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how things play out here. Really appreciate your time. I, I, do, I do have faith and hope because I'm commanded to and because I succeed in having faith and hope and maybe even a little charity on my better days. But I, that, which is to say that there is a path forward. There must be, I don't see it uh, very clearly. So the, the train wreck I describe is not a, not necessarily a final destruction. Actually, the good news is that there will not be a gradual evolution because the only gradual evolution would lead us the same way Protestant and Catholic universities have been led over the last uh, century or more. The good news is there must be a collision because the church will not let BYU become just another secular progressive university. Yeah. Well, we will see. We will see. Thanks again for your time and for your insights and your conversation, Ralph. Thank you, Greg.